Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. Hebrews. Last week we looked at Hebrews 6. Now usually when I go through a book I just go uh, Hebrews 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3 and just write on through a book. Uh, but I skipped to chapter 6 because there is a focus in Hebrews chapter 6 that really gives us insight into what this book is all about. In fact, what this book is about is uh, what it takes to be a good Christian, which is always a question among Jews and Gentiles alike. How good do you have to be to be considered a good Christian? <clears throat> which seems like a kind of an off-the-wall question, but it's not. It's the, one of the biggest debate items in the world. Partic among Christians, they argue about you have to do this, you have to do that, you don't have to do this, and the other group says, no, you got to do this and that, and, and at least one of these and some of those. And, and uh, So what do you have to do? Uh, to be a good Christian. By the way, and how do you define the word good <clears throat> in that sense? Uh, that's heavy theology right there. And you know what? Hebrews, although written to the Hebrews, amazingly, is aimed directly at this question that we wrestle with all the time about what is good and how good do you have to be. It really pinpoints that, that whole area of theology. <clears throat> how do you define good? <clears throat> you know, Hebrews is dedicated to Christian conduct. That is, being good. And, and what do you do to, to be sure that you are being good? You know, you go back to Romans. The book of Romans is aimed at teaching the necessity of the Christian faith. That is, it is necessary that you be born again and that you be baptized in the Spirit and that you be justified, sanctified, uh, and, and then in the future glorified. Hebrews doesn't go into any of those questions at all. Romans teaches the necessity of the Christian faith. Hebrews te teaches the superiority of the Christian faith. And it does it in no uncertain terms. <clears throat> and I want to go back to Hebrews 6 again. Hebrews, by the way, is written in beautiful Greek. I was tempted to read Hebrews 1, uh, chapters, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 in Greek because it is just beautiful. I mean, it, it's a recitation. It's just gorgeous language. But I won't. I'll spare you that. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, so we're starting at the end of a deposition here with the word therefore. In, in, in view of chapters 1 through 5, says the writer to the Hebrews, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. You remember what I said last week? What a strange thing to say. Why would you leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ? That's what we live by. Well, that's a tip-off to the way this book is written. <clears throat> This book is written to the Hebrews. And it is written to the Hebrews, I believe the book was written in about A.D. 68, maybe 67, just shortly before the temple was destroyed. Uh, the temple services were still in operation, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, you had courses of, priesthood, of the priesthood, uh, divided into various ranks and duties. The temple operation was the biggest thing in the old world. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Huge. Three times a year, 
Jews from all over the empire would come to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage <clears throat> to that temple. And the temple was nothing short of an absolute beehive of activity. And it was dedicated to what we see here in verse 6, the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Messiah, the Jewish priesthood yearned for the coming of Messiah. <clears throat> they yearned for the kingdom. They believed that it would come in a certain way. Well, the king came, as you know, and they refused to accept him because their view of this king was different than the actual king. And so the principles of the doctrine of Christ are the doctrine of Christ as practiced in the Holy Temple, which still existed at, that at the time this is written. Clement of Rome in AD 92 quoted Hebrews, and he quoted it talking to Jews about the realities of the faith. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, that is, the teaching that the Messiah would soon come. Now, by this time, by the time Hebrews was written to the Hebrews, Messiah had already come and gone. <clears throat> he had returned to the heavens, and he had sent forth his apostles, and yet the temple was still running. All of the, the activities of the temple were still in full operation. Let us go on to perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. This is exactly what John the Baptist said when he came announcing Jesus. He said, it's time now to leave the old things behind to look for the new things that are coming. The doctrine of baptisms, mikvaot, laying on of hands to confer the priesthood and of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. This we will do if God permit he says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance. Now, we're going to revisit these verses over and over and over again as we study Hebrews because the core of this book is in chapter 6, verses uh, about 1 through 8. If they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance. Who's being spoken of here? The Hebrews. <clears throat> the Hebrews at this time had heard of the Messiah. They, there was much conversation throughout the Roman Empire, by the way, about the coming of the king of the Jews. Roman historians wrote about it. Josephus wrote about it. The household of the Flavians was very well aware of all this Jesus talk. <clears throat> but the temple was still running. The temple in AD 68, two years before the Romans destroyed it, was still running full tilt. And this is nearing 40 years, which by the way is mentioned here, uh, after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. Forty years, the temple was still operating 24-7. And there was within the temple a faction of priests who believed the Messiah had come. And they were trying to integrate the, the, the Messiah's having come into temple worship. Well, the two did not mix. The writer to the Hebrews uh, spends his entire time in his epistle showing how they do not mix. You can't mix the death, burial, and res resurrection of Christ with anything that has to do with the Aaronic priesthood. It's very instructive for us to, to look at this as Christians, 2,000 years later, looking back at the problem they had trying to understand what to do to be a good Christian. So it's impossible if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. That there's the problem stated. We're going to stop there, and we're going to go back now and start on chapter 1, verse 1.
But again, we're going to bounce back to chapter 6 over and over and over again. And by the time we're through, you will have memorized <laughs> Hebrews 6, 1 through 8. And you'll be able to tell everybody exactly what it means. Because it's really important. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, is one sentence. Now, in, when you write in Greek, you write periodically. In English, we have a subject, and we have a, a predicate, and we may have an object, a direct object, an indirect object, uh, the object of a preposition. <clears throat> we may have a prepositional phrase. In Greek, multiply that by about 10, because Greek is an inflected language, which means that you can talk all day long and never put a period at the end of a sentence. Because things fit together in terms of connected meaning and not in terms of a subject, uh, predicate, and object. And so let's take a deep breath and read one sentence. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, worlds, who being uh, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. That's one sentence. And it's a mouthful. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, now this is about 68 AD, and the writer to the Hebrews is speaking of this as the, these last days, spoken unto us by his Son. And by the way, a note about the term last days, and that is that, that uh, Sometimes we think of last days or latter days as being the, uh, the period just before the tribulation the, or the tribulation itself. But in, in actuality, the Bible uses the phrase last days to describe the days from the resurrection of Christ until uh, the conclusion of the church age. In other words, the last days encompass a long period of time, which we would call the dispensation of the church in, in rough terms. He has spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. The Son is the heir of all things. This is very legal wording. To be an heir, certain conditions must be met. And this book goes on to talk about all of the conditions. It's a very legal book in a way by whom also he made the worlds. Through whom, through whose agency also he made the worlds. Through the agency of the Son. That's, that's the pre-incarnate Christ, Je the Jehovah of the Old Testament made the worlds. The eons is what it says in the Greek. He made the eons. How long is an eon? Unknown. Unknown. A very, very long time. Eons. It's irrelevant and immaterial where God is concerned. Before, before anything was, He is. By whom also He made the world. Who, that is, the Son, who being the, the, the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, <clears throat> and the word upholding means maintaining. It's a Greek word pharos, which means to maintain something in a constant state. 
The sun is maintaining the universe in a constant state by the word of his power. That is amazing to me. That's Jesus, you know. This man who came in the flesh and was ripped apart by the Roman soldiers and hung on a cross and went back home again is upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, that is, he cleansed our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. In other words, he accomplished what he needed to accomplish. Now this is just a preamble to the book of the Hebrews. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels. Hmm. That's interesting. So he's just being, being made so much better than the angels. Hmm. We could probably spend several hours on that. Does that mean that, that the Son was made by the Father? Hmm. Or did He always exist? Well, remember this because we're going to come back to it again. Being made so much better than the angels. Or is it merely a, a term of status? As being established in a position higher than the angels. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name. Jesus, the Son, the Lord, received by inheritance a more excellent name than any of the angels. Michael, Gabriel, all the other angels that you hear about. <clears throat> Jesus has a better name. Uh, among the Hebrews, Hashem is a common name for the name. Hashem in Hebrew means the name, and they often refer to God as the name. We refer to the preincarnate Christ as the name. Uh, the name, the unpronounceable name, the yud heh vav -Hey, Jehovah, we call him, but he is Hashem, he is the name. He hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than the angels. <clears throat> For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I have begotten thee. This day I have begotten thee, and again I will be uh, to him a father, he shall be to me as a son. Now, what you'll see as you go through Hebrews is that the writer to the Hebrews constantly quotes the Old Testament. And if you go back to the Hebrew Old Testament, the Tanakh, you'll discover that the quotes are very odd indeed. They don't match the Tanakh at all. And we'll really get into this over here in chapter 3. Uh, where Psalm 95 is quoted over and over and over again. Psalm 95 is quoted. But you go back to Psalm 95, either in English or in Hebrew, and it sort of doesn't match. That is, the quotations you find in, uh, in Hebrews don't really match the Hebrew Scriptures. What they do match, and I, I have my copy here, uh, is the Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint. This is the Old Testament written in Greek. And it dates back to 200 B.C. So here's the Greek Old Testament, which would be the Tanakh, it would be the prophets, the law, And you read it, and it's not like, it's not a, a verbatim copy of, of the Hebrew Old Testament at all. It's, it's quite different. Uh, for example, Jesus in Nazareth, you all remember the incident where he read from a scroll to the townspeople. It came his turn to read the Torah scroll. And he read from Isaiah. 
And he rolled up the scroll and he said, this day has this uh, uh, prophecy been fulfilled in your ears. And the townspeople got really upset at him, tried to kill him because he was obliquely proclaiming himself to be the Messiah, which would have been blasphemy. So you examine the quotation that, that Jesus read to the people of Nazareth in that synagogue, and you discover it doesn't match the King James quotation, nor does it match uh, the Hebrew. But what it does match is the Septuagint Greek, which means that that day in Nazareth, Jesus was reading from the Greek Old Testament scroll in Nazareth. And I want to make a point here. I'm going sort of the, the long way around to make a point. Hebrews is written in High Greek, Helene Kotera, which is a very uh, scholarly Greek. <clears throat> and it quotes scripture. All the way through the book of Hebrews, you will find scriptural quotes from the Old Testament. And each and every single one of them is from the Septuagint, the Greek uh, Old Testament, and not from the, uh, the, the Hebrew Scriptures. So what this means is that this very important letter addressed by an unknown writer, I personally think it was Paul who wrote it, but officially it's an unknown writer who wrote the Hebrews, this unknown writer wrote to faithful Jews two years before the temple was destroyed in High Greek, quoting the Septuagint. That was his way of appealing to them. He did not write in Hebrew quoting from the Hebrew. And why do I make such a point out of this? Because it helps you to understand elsewhere in the New Testament uh, the reasoning behind the way the Bible was translated the way it was and presented the way it was. <clears throat> in other words, uh, the, the, uh, the language of the student in the days of Jesus was Greek. You went to a college, you studied Greek. Now, if you went to a yeshiva, you would study Hebrew and Greek. But, but the common street language was Greek. Everybody spoke Greek. People argue about what Jesus and his disciples spoke to each other. I'm pretty sure they all spoke Greek while they were walking down the street. Because everybody did. Everybody in Jerusalem spoke Greek. And in the area of the temple where you find carvings uh, on the, the remains of the walls of the temple, you find uh, Hebrew carvings. Uh, archaic Hebrew carvings, but you also find Greek all over the place. So it had to be written in Hebrew and Greek uh, to a lesser degree in Latin. Fewer people understood Latin. But here's a guy, the author of Hebrews, who's writing to the intelligentsia of, of the Jews in Hellenicotera Greek and quoting from the Septuagint to make his points. Verse 5, for under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. That's Psalm chapter 2. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That's quoting uh, from four places, Deuteronomy 33, Psalm 45, Psalm and uh, Isaiah 61 in various places here. And if you go back to the Septuagint, you'll discover the style, phrasing, uh, the quotation is always from the Greek Old Testament. So this guy's making his point from the Greek Old Testament. As we go on, 
Verse 10, And thou, O Lord, in the beginning hath laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they shall all wax old, as doth a garment, and as a vesture. And shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Now again, we're quoting here from Psalm 102, 25, and 26, Isaiah 51. Uh, we're quoting extensively, and, and the writer to the Hebrews just does this. He quotes uh, scripture after scripture after scripture to make his point. And what is his point? That the Son is better than the angels. God has a Son, and the Son is of a higher, if you will, status than the angels. To which of the angels said he at any time, sit thou on my, sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool, Psalm 110. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? This is a good Jewish question. In, in the teaching, uh, in Hebrew teachings, but the, you use the pill pool method. And if you examine uh, Jesus' own teaching, you'll discover that he always taught by asking questions. Somebody asked him a question, he would ask them a question. Who's greater, Jesus? And Jesus says, anybody got a coin? Pull out a coin. You know, whose image is on this coin? He's always asking question after question. This is the, the Hebraic method. It's called pill pull. Always uh, answer a question with another question. And hopefully your question will be better than the first question. <clears throat> and the question here is, are they not, and speaking of the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? That's us, by the way. The angels minister to us. We are the heirs of salvation. Uh, I just thank God for the promise of ministering angels. I need all the ministering angels I can get. I don't know about you. Seriously. They, uh, uh, and they're around, by the way. They really are. Don't make the mistake of thinking they're not. They're here right now. You can't see them. Occasionally they show themselves and people get a chance to entertain them, as, as was written, you know, in the well-known uh, comment, and, and many have entertained angels unaware. Hmm. Think you ever have? I think I have. And I think you have too. Verse 2, for if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast and every transgression disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neg neglect so great salvation? A question. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us that heard him. So the writer here is including himself in having heard teaching, words spoken by the Lord at the first of his public ministry when he began to speak. Verse 4, God also bearing the witness both with signs and wonders, with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Yeah. If the word of the angels was good, the word of the Son of God has got to be good. Even better. And it, here's a fascinating thing. What a, what a strange way to begin a letter. First chapter here is talking about Christ being superior to the angels. Well, to me, that's very elementary stuff, and to you it is too. Well, we all think of, well, Jesus, Son of God, is superior to the angels. Why would you need to expound on that already known principle? Because the audience here 
is being taken in baby steps all the way through the groundwork of our common faith. Starting with, Christ is superior to the prophets, he's superior to the angels. If we neglect the salvation that was offered to us, we could run into some real trouble. Well, why would we neglect that salvation? As you read on into this letter, you discover that the writer to the Hebrews is writing to people who already believe in the risen Christ. And, and this is true. The, the, pe the people who are the object of this epistle believe in Jesus. But as you read on, you discover that they are also tied to temple worship. The temple still standing at that day, and the temple still being in operation in that day. These people were torn between, wow, should, where should I give my tithes and offerings and, and uh, the honoraria do the priesthood? And what's the function of the priesthood in the temple? Uh, as opposed to, say, an apostle over here who comes and, and presents the risen Christ and the gospel of grace. I got the gospel of grace over here, and I've got the, the law in the temple over here. And so if you lived in that day, you, you could very easily be torn in two by a, a desire to honor the Aaronic priesthood and to honor the risen Christ. And this would raise a lot of questions in your mind, and the Hebrews is designed to answer those questions. And you say, well, why are we even studying this? The temple got, uh, got burnt down in 70 AD. There's no more priesthood. This is not even a question for us. Oh, yes, it is. Because legalism is one of the problematic areas of Christianity. And Hebrews speaks straight to legalism is written to the priesthood. When you come right down to it, it's written to the creme de la creme of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. It's written to the people who were basically running Jerusalem at that time. Now, it's about A.D. 68. And so, as this thing unfolds, you discover this, wow, this is really answering some questions that I've had for a long time. Verse 5, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. There's a new world coming, a new kingdom. It's an earthly kingdom, and it's a heavenly kingdom, a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, how is the, the new heavens and the new earth going to be comported? How is it going to operate? Well, not by the angels, says here. But one in a certain place, and this is a quotation of Psalm 8, testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. Now this is all a quotation from Psalm 8 in the Septuagint Bible. It's the Greek Psalm 8, and not the Hebrew Psalm 8. He's making his point to the Hebrews who would be, it would be carrying around little copies of the Septuagint. As surprising as that sounds, and a lot of people are very surprised that you'd think the Hebrews would be studying Hebrew, and, and they did. But when it came to, to their scriptures, they read from the Greek. Why? Because the Greek was a more familiar language to them. It was the language of the street. So we have, have now quoted Psalm 8. Rereading verse 8, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not under him. But now we see, not yet, all things put under him. 
But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, by whom are all things, and in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus was made perfect through suffering. Well, wasn't he already perfect when he came? Yes. Before he ever was incarnated, he was perfect. Wasn't he perfect all the time he was alive on earth? Yes. But he wasn't completely perfect. His perfection relied upon the completion. When, you remember when he said on the cross, Tetelestai, it is finished. At that moment then, he had been made perfect through suffering. And, you know... When you read that, if you're like me, you say, oh, the Lord was made perfect through suffering. Well, I sure hope he doesn't make me perfect through suffering. <clears throat> I'd just rather forego that part, thank you very much. But on the other hand, the Bible suggests that the sufferings of this world are not in vain. They have a reason. They have a purpose. And there are many sufferings. There are emotional, mental, physical sufferings that we bear, frustrations that we'll carry with us all of our lives. And, uh, and you say, God, why did you allow that to happen or this to happen? Or that just shouldn't have happened the way it did. And, and God, if you'd been anywhere nearby, that never would have happened. Well, you uh, second-guessing God. It's one of our favorite occupations. Jesus was made perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee? Psalm 22. By the way, Psalm 22 is the, the psalm of the crucifixion, as you all know. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Uh, the word partaker in the King James in verse 14 is a, a really interesting word which we will revisit again and again and again in the book of Hebrews. It's one of the main words in the book of Hebrews. Partaker is translated from the Greek word metakos, M-E-T-A-C-H-O-S, or chi-O-S, metakos, metakos. And it's translated partaker in English. And, but what it means in Greek is business partner. It's the common Greek word in Hellenic Kotera and in Koine. It's the common word for partnership. If you are in business with somebody and this person is your partner in business, it's the Greek word metachos. And the writer to the Hebrews uses this word very often. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. And here's the first statement of a principle which comes booming through all the way through the book of Hebrews, and that is that you are a partner, if you are truly born again, if you are a, a faithful Christian, you are a partner in the business sense with Jesus. You are literally a, uh, and it seems crass to say a business partner, but not only are you family, as described in the other epistles, but, but 
the book of Hebrews describes you as a partner, a working partner with Christ. The children are partakers of flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy all that had the power of death, destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver uh, them through fear of death, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, he took uh, on him the seed of Abraham. And that is an important sentence. Jesus did not take upon himself the genetic nature of angels. He could have, but we learn all through the Bible that the angels are a different type of creature than a human. They have a different genetic makeup. Their, that is, their seed is a different seed. The Bible, both in the Old and New Testaments, uses the word tseroa in the Old Testament, sperma in the New Testament, seed in English, meaning genetic material, DNA, as we would call it. And there is one DNA of the angels, and there's another DNA of Abraham. And he took upon himself the DNA of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful, a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he, he himself hath suffered being tempted, he's able to help them that are tempted. He speaks as one who's gone through all of the things that we go through. And more, I'm sure. Again, to go back to the Greeks, in Periclean Greece, the days of the philosophers, the philosophers said, that there is a prime mover, God, in the heavens, but that human beings would never see the prime mover. He's up there several layers and generations away from planet Earth, and he would never come to Earth because to do so, he would sully himself. He'd get his feet dirty on planet Earth, and the prime mover would never do that, said the Greeks. This was the essence of Greek philosophy. And they wrestled with the question of how the prime mover actually moves the earth since he would never deign to descend to earth and thereby sully himself. And the question of how the prime mover visited planet earth is really implicit in the book of Hebrews. Verse 18, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted or tested, he is able to help those who, that are tempted. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers, and there it is again, Metakoi is the plural, metachos, a partner. Wherefore, holy brethren, that's all of us who are saved, partakers or partners in the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now, chapter 3, the subject is changed. And now the writer is going to start talking about how uh, Christ is superior to Moses and the Aaronic priesthood. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider uh, the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath uh, built the house, hath more honor than the house. The house, of course, is a reflection of the idea of the tabernacle in the wilderness and all that it stood for. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony 
of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast, uh, the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Moses here in verse 5 is called a servant. Now, a lot of times in the New Testament when you see the word servant, it's a translation of the Greek doulos, which means slave. But here, uh, the word for servant is therapon, T-H-E-R-A-P-O-N, from which we get our word therapy. A therapon is a servant who voluntarily gives service to someone else expecting nothing in return. Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken afterward. Now, I'm skating across a lot of really heavy-duty concepts here, but we're going to get back to these. What I want to do is lay the groundwork. <coughs> But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. We are the house. The oikomene. The, uh, we are the economy. We are the functioning system, is what it's saying. Whose house we are. We are the functioning system of Christ if we hold fast in the confidence and rejoicing the hope firm unto the end. Now you get down to verse 7, and in verses 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and then down to 15, the writer to the Hebrews is quoting Psalm 95. And he's quoting Psalm 95 from the Septuagint, <clears throat> the Greek. And this is interesting. Wherefore, and we're going to, I'm going to read this and we'll take this up next week. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. This is Psalm 95. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and they said, and said, do they always err in their hearts? They do always err in their heart, and have not known my way. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. That's from Psalm 95. Now, reading here from a, uh, a, a Jewish commentary on the Psalms, it's called Tehillim. And here's what they say about Psalm 95. This is what a Jewish text says about Psalm 95. This is the sixth of the 11 Psalms which Moses composed. Psalm 95 is the sixth Mosaic Psalm. He dedicated it to the tribe of Issachar, a family of scholars who were constantly immersed in the joyous study and song of the Torah. So the house of Issachar was known as the house that really, really got with Bible study. And then here this Hebrew commentary, modern Jewish commentary says, this psalm is composed of two parts. The first seven verses are the psalmist's call to his people. Come with alacrity to sing to God, praise Him, thank Him, acknowledge Him as the sole creator and guiding force of the universe in general and Israel in particular. True, in our present state of exile and subjugation, we may seem to be forsaken, writes this Jewish commentator, but the situation is only temporary. It can change. It can change today if we heed his call. The second section of Psalm 95 is a form of direct exhortation from God to Israel in which he recalls the disastrous results of our ancestors' sins in the wilderness and urges us not to emulate that course. Don't be like the people in the wilderness who lost their faith. Well, the writer to the Hebrews here in verses 8, 9, 10, 11, 15, is quoting this psalm dedicated to the house of Issachar who loved to study the Bible. 
Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation of the day of temptation of the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, they saw my works forty years. And by the way, this wording comes directly from the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, not from the Hebrew Old Testament. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. This guy is now getting serious. The writer to the Hebrews is aiming this at the Hebrew people who acknowledge Christ, but have not yet received Christ. They're still wavering. They're still uh, moving back toward temple worship. And, and think about it. This, the, this most beautiful building operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The priests all in gorgeous costumes, gold and silver everywhere, trumpets. Uh, formal activity, uh, beautiful lights and sounds. It was just spectacular. How could you ever leave temple worship and go and follow Jesus? How could you ever do that? It was a real dilemma for them. And the dilemma thickens as you get through the book of Hebrews. I want to say one thing here. The writer to the Hebrews, up here in verse 9, quotes Psalm 95, verse 10. They saw my works 40 years. Drop down to verse uh, 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. You know, Paul called himself a Hebrew of the Hebrews. This book is written to the Hebrews. I think it was written by Paul. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Wiest of Moody Bible Institute, Greek scholar, said he thought it was written by Paul. Dr. J. Vernon McGee said he thought it was written by Paul. Paul would know more than anybody. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a, a, a very high ranking. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He says, exhort one another daily, verse 13, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through to the deceitfulness of sin, for we, were, we are made partakers. There's that word again, metakoi. We have been made partners. Now, guess what? A partnership implies a certain kind of equality. When you go in partnership with somebody, how do you do that? Do you decide, now you're going to be the senior partner and I'm going to be the junior partner, but I don't know whether that may change down the line somewhere. How do you define partner? Is it equal? How would you legally define a partnership? <clears throat> because this is calling believers in Christ partners with Christ, using the very word business partner with Christ. Uh, are you a business partner with Christ? Do you want to do the common business? Do you want to, he's doing his father's work. Are you doing his work? Are you a true metakos business partner? He says, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. And that goes back to, to Exodus uh, and the Exodus story where at uh, Massa and Meribah the people revolted. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom he wa what, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So, we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now we're getting to the subject, unbelief. He's talking here to people who have seen, they've witnessed the risen Christ, they acknowledge everything the apostles are saying about him, but they're vacillating. They have not received him completely. They have one foot in temple worship and one foot 
in this strange unknown world out here where you follow Jesus by faith. A final note, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? How long was it from the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to the destruction of the temple? 40 years. It's God's number of testing. From the crucifixion to the destruction of the temple was 40 years. We are nearing the end of the 40 year period as we read Hebrews. And the writer to the Hebrews is now shaking the finger and saying, with whom was he grieved those 40 years? Implying something that we all know in retrospect really happened, that after 40 years the temple was destroyed. No coincidence there that a 40 year period elapsed. This then is the preamble to Hebrew. The writer then, it gets increasingly serious as you go through the text. He comes to the point where he says, you gotta decide. Now, why is this relevant for us? We've all decided, we all follow Jesus. We recognize who Jesus is. There's no danger in us going back to worshiping the Aaronic priesthood. So why is it profitable for us to read the epistle to the Hebrews? Because where Romans talks about the necessity of salvation, Hebrews talks about the superiority of our salvation. Every Christian needs to understand why his own personal salvation is actually quite superior to anything else on planet Earth. What does it take to be a good Christian? This letter answers that question.